Ну, неплохо, мне нравится. Hello. If someone is here, tell us if you can see us or hear us. Hello. I think no one is here yet. Let's... I don't know. This is four people, I think. Oh, there. Oh, hey. Hey, Dennis. Hello. <laughs> That's my co-author. Hello, Dennis. Nice to meet you, Olga. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we will start in three minutes, as promised. And we just check that our beautiful surround is here. Okay, good. Although this was a mathematical pillow. Oh, really? Yes, look. We have some polyhedra on it. That's why I thought maybe it can ah, be inside. Okay, but... great. <laughs> hey. Hello. <laughs> oh, people are coming. It's like starting a party, but you don't have to, to clean the to apartment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, hi. Добрый день. <laughs> yeah, I don't see very well what people write because it's very tiny. Oh, but I'll try. I'll we will do like this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll so I'll be taking a look at what people are writing. Thank you. Can we push this? Oh yeah. Is it working? Well, better than nothing. <laughs> <laughs> So if we were really popular, then there would be so many people that they, they would be writing greetings from Australia, greetings from uh, Nicaragua and other things. But uh, so far, I think every country is represented by one person. So <laughs> they write from themselves. <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay, we'll start in a minute. Meanwhile, if you have any questions that you want us to discuss, so we will be talking uh, about uh, various popularizations of mathematics. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions or topics you want us to discuss, feel free to write in the chat. Uh, I prepared some questions that I thought would be good to discuss, but we, we are happy to get inputs from you too. Yes, and also stories, and maybe if you have some uh, stories of outreach to share, or experience from the side of a person who did outreach or who received outreach as well. I think it also yeah. can be interesting. So if while we're talking you have something to share, please do write. I'll be I'll be secretly reading. So my plan is that Olga will be talking and I'll be reading what you're writing because <laughs> I have done little outreach. <laughs> okay. My parents are writing us that we look pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. That's important. I um, have to thank you for Mura looking pretty good, and let's thank my parents for me looking pretty good. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I think um, we. Okay. Let's wait. We, we will wait one last minute and then start. That's we promise. That's it. Yes. We're just on time. Swiss time. Oh, and we have a hope. So Olga has a very cute looking cat. She's more of a bobcat instead, not really like a usual cute cat. What do you mean by bobcat? I think she looks more serious and uh, quite scary. So there is a chance that she joins us at some point. Yes, she can give a serious look, but she is also tender inside. Yes, she is. I mean, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh huh. Yeah, I, I also have a lot to say against Math Olympics. That's an interesting stuff. Maybe I should not be talking about it. Uh, mm, interesting. We can have a debate because I can say some good also about Math Olympics. Also bad, uh, but maybe. <laughs> okay, maybe later. Um, so I think we don't we don't want to make you wait long any longer. So let us start. Um, today, um, we my guest and I will be talking about the popularization of mathematics in different ways, which we call outreach. And my guest today uh, is uh, Olga Paris romaskevich a researcher at, uh, CNRS researcher at Marseille Institute of Mathematics, who has done a lot of outreach. And I only recently became interested in this subject, so I hope to learn a lot today and maybe say something. Um, 
thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I did some outreach, uh, but uh, I don't. Uh, I have to say already that I don't feel as a uh, great specialist on outreach. I would say I'm just a practitioner. <laughs> so uh, I will be happy to have other opinions. I, I don't want to say that everything I say is like uh, you have to engrave it in gold. It's just my uh, personal experience and opinion on different outreach projects uh, based on the experience from different outreach projects I have done. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be on your channel. Oh. Me. Once again. Yeah. So we actually <laughs> met today first time in person. We are like we meet together with you all <laughs> together first time. And so uh, to start, could you maybe uh, tell us about some outreach projects you did? And um, I guess the main question uh, for me would be what were your goals and what weren't particularly well and what went not so well? What would you like to improve? On? Okay. So let me tell you about... Uh, some projects, uh, let's, let me choose two for now and then we may speak about more. So uh, I have two projects that I did this year that were uh, the most important for me. Uh, the one is, uh, it's called Sigal. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's a name of a small insect in, in French. I don't know how it's in English. Uh, anyway, it's a school for girls in mathematics. Uh, they uh, come in the last uh, year of school, so they're like 16, 17. And they come uh, for one week to a place in France, in Marseille, which is called Siam. It's a center of mathematical uh, meetings. And they spend all the week there doing mathematics, meeting researchers in mathematics, um, doing sports also in the afternoon because it's impossible to do mathematics all the day, as all know. Uh, and uh, they meet uh, also some people who wor work in uh, different areas, uh, not necessarily pure research, but uh, different jobs related to mathematics. Uh, for example, engineers, or they go to some uh, sports uh, club where people work on um, uh, sportsman activity and use some mathematical graphs to study their activities, etc., etc. So it's one week, and uh, I have been uh, an organizer of this uh, school for two years, and it exists for three years. So uh, it was an initiative of uh, researchers in Marseille. Uh, this is uh, the um, the school that I really like. Um, girls are very happy after it, uh, and it's uh, uh, I think it's quite uh, easy and uh, objective uh, thing to see that if everybody smiles and thank, says thank you, thank you, thank you, it means that it worked well. Um, uh, and uh, so my goals when I joined this project um, were um, to be helpful to organize something for long term because many of the outreach projects that I did before were like one day or two hours, something very short. And when you have five days with people who are not necessarily uh, mathematicians or do not know anything about what uh, the researcher's job is, uh, I think it's it's much more true uh, to show mathematicians on the five-day basis, not only for one hour when they talk about mathematics, because they can see many aspects of us. So this was important for me in this project. Um, and uh, since this year, we also started working with sociologists who come to this week and observe what we do. And I was at the base of the idea of uh, inviting them. And for me, it was also important to understand uh, what are we doing right and wrong in this presentation of mathematics, because I think that sometimes we may present mathematics in a non-inclusive way and be actually um, not productive. Like we want to share mathematics and uh, our love to it, but Instead of it, we do something wrong, and actually people say, oh, actually, I hate mathematics, and it's not for me. And it's it's very sad, because our goal is the inverse of that. Um, and the other point, so it's a school only for girls, and uh, I, I wanted to know if this is meaningful to do the schools only for girls, and uh, what uh, can I have some solid objective arguments to defend this way as this kind of initiatives? Uh, and I can already say that sociologists who worked with us on the project uh, confirmed it because some of the girls wouldn't come if uh, it was a mixed school, uh, as we learned from the interviews. So you said, I was, I was very impressed actually that 
can I say the statistic that three girls out of 22? Yes, at said, least. At, at least three girls out of 22 said that their parents would not let them come to the school with, with, with boys, right? So these yes. are um, girls from very conservative families. Yes, in, in Marseille, there are very, very different social uh, classes of people who live there and girls from uh, conservative families, they uh, they usually don't leave the house much, even like the, their their life is happening in like one kilometer radius, and not only in COVID times, like usually, and it's very hard to get out, and this was an opportunity for them to get very far, uh, so... And also learn something about math. I, I think those, uh, this school is um, is important for me because it also shows how not important mathematics is in this project. Because actually the girls meet each other, they do sports together, they have a discotheque one day, a boom uh, party, a disco party, and uh, they become very close to each other and they laugh and they discuss many other things in math. And I think it is very strong point of this. Uh, project that we are not only we we look not only as mathematicians but as humans and they also can not only come with their mathematical part and interest but also with um, with who they are as humans maybe one more funny thing that we learned uh, uh, from sociologists so the first day before the school like the uh, sunday night when girls meet in in uh, Siam, when they discover each other and meet one of the first things they did when they met, they shared their names, of course, but also their grades in math. <laughs> like, hello, I'm Olga. I have 18 over 20 in mathematics. Really? Yes. <laughs> Interesting fact. Wow. It's very French thing, but uh, that mathematics is used to grade yourself, so you kind of use it as a as a number to present yourself, which is I find quite sad, but that's a fact. That's what happened uh, that night. Yes, yeah, so this is one of the projects I did recently, and uh, I'm very happy that we're doing it. Did you have other questions in your list? Um, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, I think you said what, what, what your goals were and uh, what went well. Maybe what would you like to improve or what you saw? Maybe did you learn from the sociologists that we do something in the wrong way mm -hmm. as... Um, as our attempts to do outreach. Yeah, so the school was in October and sociologists need time to learn everything, but there were some things that uh, uh, Clémence Pironet, who is a sociologist on this project, uh, said. Uh, it is not uh, exactly applied to mathematics, but she told me about um, this bias that we have in presenting the sense of mathematics, like why, why mathematics is in the world, and different mathematicians respond differently to this question. There are many, many ways to respond. Some of them say uh, mathematics is useful for people and for myself uh, because uh, it is beautiful, because it uh, uh, is, uh, has harmony, because it's surprising, because it makes us dream. Things which are abs quite abstract. And there are other people who would say mathematics is useful because you can apply it uh, in different domains of science. You can... Uh, build things with it, you can uh, uh, connect people with it, etc. And these two ways of presenting seem, from the sociological point of view, uh, to correlate with the social class of the person who is speaking about it. Uh, and uh, I found it quite interesting, also from the didactical point of view, because uh, in this week, in the beginning of the week, we present uh, different problems on which girls can work. They choose a problem that, on which they want to work and they uh, uh, make groups. Uh, and the problems we present, we present the problems we like and we think uh, that will be interesting to study. And some of these problems kind of have the taste of mathematics, which goes in one way <laughs> and some in another way. And it's very interesting to see what girls choose what problem. So it's kind of if our social class was related to the mathematics we like, which is quite scary. But so it's it's uh, what I'm saying about mathematics now. It's it, it more a sociological, a sociological hypothesis than a fact. But that's what we are trying also to explore in this project. Uh, and if something of that is true, uh, it can be also interesting how we as mathematicians present uh, mathematics. Um, what other values uh, we transfer with it. Like I often hear that mathematics is abstract, 
and yeah. that doesn't have to do uh, with humans uh, failures and something like that but it seems that it's the inverse that happens probably mm. so. <laughs> interesting um oh and there's a question how old were the girls and what was the level so the girls are 16 Uh, it's uh, an age in France when they have to choose. Uh, so to, uh, the system, French education system, is changing very uh, lots of times. But this is the time that they have to choose uh, the specialization in school. Like for example, some would choose to do more mathematics, some would choose to stop doing mathematics. So it's a very important time, and they also it's like they have one more year before before they choose in which universities to go or not to do university studies at all. So for us, it's a very important moment to. Uh, to speak with them about mathematics, but also about opportunities mathematics gives, not only being a researcher in mathematics, but in general. Um, and uh, the level of mathematics, so we give them problems that they can understand. Um, for example, let me tell you one example of the problem. So uh, you take uh, a piano and you want to put it in the room so that it enters the room. Uh, so the question is how big the piano can be, uh, what is uh, the form of the room, whatever. And the basic start is you have a square and you need to put the, uh, for example, the equilateral triangle of the biggest area inside, what is the area of the triangle. And then you can go um, build on uh, this question and uh, go further. And many problems are like this, that you have a basic problem, which is already not as easy uh, for a 16-year-old uh, person. Uh, but then you can go further and further and they can play with it. So the level of, of mathematics for me is just um, such that you can access it and then go in the directions you, you want. Yeah, you start from a triangle or piano <laughs> and then go from there. <laughs> so, okay. um, I'd also like to share something. Um, well, uh, my main outreach project is this YouTube channel, which is going so great that I mean, when I'm posting the videos, it's going so great that I cannot complain about anything, or at least it's going much better than I could possibly expect. So no complaints there. You you all are perfect. By the way, yeah, feel free to, to write us any comments or something. But um, this, um, oh, I also wanted to ask you guys, uh, whoever is here, to share us links to, if you have uh, links to your favorite outreach projects, or I don't know, tell us about things you've done if you do any outreach will be interested. Uh, and meanwhile, I'd like to um, to share the struggles I'm having when I try to speak about math to general audience, and then maybe I hope someone, you or my the audience, will give me some advice. So um, it's not actually an outreach project. It's just that you know people often um, asked. Um, yeah. So um, people uh, often ask you know to tell about math you do like some non-mathematicians, and I start explaining, and I notice, I mean, I try to explain in the way that makes sense to me, but I often notice that people lose interest quickly, very quickly, like within minutes, a few minutes. And I was wondering why it's happening, and then um, I learned one thing that uh, could maybe be interesting to anyone who is struggling with the same. I guess we all try to explain to our relatives and friends. And so I was at this... Um, Uh, talk by Steven Strogatz, an applied mathematician who wrote uh, columns for New York Times uh, explaining math uh, to 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 a very general audience, like some basic math. And he said that the rule he figured out is, and that I think is the mistake that I'm usually making, I don't know how to avoid it, is that um, people outside math are okay if you if you tell them about some concept, they, they can accept it if it's uh, either abstract but familiar, or uh, unfamiliar but concrete. So um, there should be, um, there, there, they should uh, relate, be able to relate to this concept either because it's concrete or because it's something familiar. And uh, he said that you should never try to introduce immediately something that is unfamiliar and abstract. And guess what, whenever I try to talk about algebraic geometry, Um, that's what usually happens. I immediately speak about something unfamiliar and abstract. And this, he says in his experience, and he um, has been successful at presenting math to general audience, that's the, the issue. And so um, I don't yet know how to get around this issue. But yeah, if, if you have more advice, please let me know. And maybe, um, yeah, how, how to talk about abstract math without, without uh, 
by like coming and uh, facing this obstacle. However, one thing I did uh, learn also from uh, from journalism, which I tried to apply recently, and I think this does make sense, and it's another mistake we often make, is um, that uh, so in journalism there is a rule, well, uh, sort of a, a moral rule that uh, one text uh, should uh, communicate one idea or one main thought that you shouldn't try to, in a short text to communicate many, many different things at once, uh, like focus on one thing. And I tried in my, like in short presentations to uh, focus just on one thing. And uh, I think uh, this works. And uh, also recently, so I've been working on a secret project that I don't want to tell you much about yet, but at least it uh, helps me to see how other mathematicians, when asked to tell just about one thing, do struggle with it because we are so used when talking like within mathematics to talk about all the different you know concepts and subjects at once because they're very interrelated. However, talking to when talking to general audience, I guess it's important to be able to somehow throw like to, to focus just on one thing and then maybe say it has connections but not give people an impression that if they understood something, they get immediately lost when you talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you gave us two, two good pieces of advice. <laughs> not say unfamiliar and ab abstract at one time and not tell more than one thing at a time. Yeah, but I'm curious if anyone has more advice or if you, I, I like I as I am uh, willing to, to hear more advice because I think for all of us, it's important to be able to mm -hmm. communicate what we're Yeah, I, I really like this idea about unfamiliar and abstract at the same time as being an impossible challenge to attend. So I'm kind of interested to kind of think what we can do to uh, get over this. The first idea is that it's like you try to go from this uh, problem to some other problem, which is maybe abstract but familiar <laughs> <laughs> or unfamiliar but not abstract. Uh, if you really want to explain what you're talking about. Another way that I think people often take with this kind of uh, problems, they don't speak about the problem itself and mathematics in itself, but they speak about how do they feel about it and how do they work with it. But they don't really explain the problem, so mm -hmm. maybe it's not the answer. And, maybe, mm -hmm. I, and I also don't know if it's really interesting. Like, may, Yeah, I think it is interesting. Uh, I mean, for myself it's very interesting, but I don't know what people search uh, in mathematicians' minds. This is one of the questions which always uh, bothered me. Like, uh, maybe what uh, what goes wrong or like what I want to know is uh, feedback from general audience because we not very often get it. Like, what, uh, what was successful, what wasn't, where did I lost somebody? Uh, like a sincere answer to that is so valuable, but it's very hard to find a way to, to ask the question. Steven Strogatz in his talk said that while he was writing the columns for New York Times, people could also write comments and he was too sensitive to read the comments. So he asked his wife to read the comments and tell him in a nicer form the feedback he was getting. <laughs> because at some point when he did like the infamiliar abstract, mm -hmm. people got quite pissed. <laughs> So yeah, maybe kind feedback is good. Um, do you want to tell about the other projects you did or you want to go to? Yeah, I can tell about uh, another project. It's true that the first one is, uh, I don't know, some like the only thing that went wrong with the first one, I think today is just that uh, uh, administrative issues are big and we have to organize it. This is the only thing that we can maybe simplify and find uh, some sponsors or something like that. I mean, we have sponsors, but we have too many of them and they don't give enough money each one, so we have to make a big sum. But anyway, uh, another project I worked on this year is um, uh, was uh, a very nice movie project. Uh, it was not initiated by myself, it was initiated by a professional director, uh, animation director uh, called Denis Van Garbeck who works in France, and his idea was to make a series of short movies about mathematics, 10 of them, and to put them on the Arte channel. It's a, uh, it's a TV channel in France, but he uh, put the videos on the web uh, site of the Arte, because actually on the TV they, uh, they were not ready to um, produce uh, the movies about mathematics. They don't think the audience is ready for mathematics. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, so uh, Denis, he um, 
chose 10 subjects of mathematics he wanted to uh, cover and then he contacted 10 mathematicians and worked with each of one of them on uh, on the movie so we worked on a movie about complex numbers it's like eight minutes movie uh, and we wrote the script together so in practice we just spoke to each other i explained to Denis what complex numbers are in my opinion <laughs> and we did some uh equation solving uh and uh try to do a movie and think about uh, animation ideas how we can explain complex numbers and it was a very fun project it's, it was a much shorter project than the first one but uh well very important for me because i like cinema very much and i like thinking about the ways of telling mathematics uh, and here we could really sync, rewrite the script, rewrite it one more time. And also, since it is an animation movie, you have lots of liberty to uh, find some ways to explain. Uh, yeah, so this was another project that we did. And I can say some things that went wrong, in my opinion, uh, today. So I think the collaboration with Denis was perfect. We, he was very interested in mathematics. Uh, and uh, I think he loves mathematics from a long time and he was really interested to understand uh, what complex numbers are. Uh, for an adult person, it's uh, for me, I think it's uh, very honorable. <laughs> and um, But one of the things that, which went wrong, uh, there are no women in my uh, story and there are no women in any of the movies uh, Denis made. And I don't think it's uh, entirely his fault. I think it's also the uh, problem of us mathematicians who were his advisors in telling the story. And myself, when I was uh, writing the story about complex numbers, I understood one, one very important thing that, okay, I'm a mathematician. I know what complex numbers are. Who invented them, how it went, all the story. I don't know it very well. I mean, I know what I was told at university, at school, some days, and the, the, the story which is constructed in my head on the history of mathematics has actually lots of biases. Uh, and to be able to tell the history of mathematics, if you want to do it, maybe better consult historians. For example, in, in question of women, not to forget women. And in general, not to forget people who thought about this question. Uh, for example, in our movie, uh, the story of complex numbers and of numbers in general is more, mostly concentrated in Europe somewhere between France uh, uh, and Germany, but also this view point is not true and very, uh, very kind of uh, disbalanced. So there are, at least for myself, uh, the lesson I learned is that if I want to tell the history of mathematics, I shouldn't rush because uh, in this way many hard, many things can be uh, avoided that shouldn't be avoided. So yeah, this is uh, from what went wrong, a little part, uh, little confessions of what went wrong. I see. So uh, you are asked to drop a link, but is it is there a link on your web page? Um, uh, not yet, but I will put it for sure. Uh, if not, you can go to Arte. Uh, you, you, you type arte.tv uh, slash math. Okay, let's do it. Uh, Arte point. TV. Slash mat, uh, maybe with S, maybe Something without, <laughs> and you will find five of the first movies. The movie I worked on is not yet out, but it will be out uh, soon. And they also have a YouTube channel where they put videos. There are other videos. There is a video on Poincare conjecture about irrational numbers, uh, about uh, topology, about uh, many, many things. So enjoy. Cool. Yeah, thank you. And thank you. Yeah, that's a good point that our, our, I mean, I personally know, I think, almost no math history because I think when you study mathematics uh, and it's, I am sure, not just my um, thing that you, you have so much an overwhelming amount of mathematics to study and you try to understand the modern things because, you know, people around discuss modern research topics that, uh, it's very hard to find free time to study, you know, the history and how we came there. And um, yeah, I think um, I'm sure many mathematicians know little math history. It's somehow uh, orthogonal maybe to, to, to research in a sense. And that's why it requires additional studies. And it's, you're right, it's important to remember that how little we know of, of math history. Yes. Yes, and uh, also, maybe the idea for directors uh, 
a director who does a movie of, about mathematics and who contacts a mathematician thinking that we are specialists. Uh, uh, we are, but not in the history of mathematics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and probably the best way is to contact different people and to have different points of view and yeah, mm -hmm. do well the research on the movie. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you for telling about it. So um, uh, I wanted to um, to ask some more general questions. Um, so my uh, first question would be, and yeah, feel free to ask more questions. Um, so um, I'm skipping. The, I mean, we will get to some of them. Uh, but uh, I wonder generally, what are your reasons to do outreach? And uh, maybe I could, since uh, uh, you've talked about your projects, maybe I could start with giving my reasons. Yes, please. Okay, cool. So um, my main reason is that um, I've um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it, and it took me a while to finally formulate that. While math is great, and I love math, but also um, I love people, and uh, there are a few things that make me even happier than seeing people getting excited by something I'm doing or giving them. And so I finally formulated my goal to, as to give people joy by means of math. And um, so for me, outreach is anything that is within that concept. And okay, there are also, of course, more different parts of outreach, but whatever satisfies that goal uh, sounds like outreach to me. And um, well, um, it's really great, you know, when you can share something you're passionate about and make people happy. I mean, what what what, what can be better, right? Uh, but also, uh, besides personal um, personal joy that one gets, I think uh, my impression is that mathematics um, has a giant potential for giving people both joy and pain. And somehow the second the, the, the letter has been used so well everywhere. Like starting from early in school, somehow the potential of math to give pain is wonderfully realized. And just like it's one of the most successful projects <laughs> that humanity has ever taken. <laughs> Whereas the potential to give joy, I think, is so under, real, under realized in so many ways that there is just, I mean, whatever one does, I think works up to an extent because it's just so... Mm, the the comparison of what has been done in this and the comparison of what, what math can give, I think, is um, very yeah. So th there is a lot of space. I, uh, I can I interrupt you because this thought uh, it's true. I agree. At the same time, uh, when you say that uh, mathematics uh, has been um, has been not used enough to give joy, but at the same moment, I think that there are some that people. I believe that people love mathematics, like by default. But the thing is that sometimes they enjoy something, and actually there is a mathematical component in it, but it's just there is nobody who can, would come and say, actually, it's mathematics that you like. Like there is this part which is mathematics, that just people don't recognize mathematics and things they like, because uh, uh, we, we don't get used to this uh, uh, seeing the mathematics in things we do. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think mathematics is giving joy to people, but it's just not getting enough uh, recognition. recognition. Ah, interesting. Do you have an example in mind? Uh, I don't know people who like puzzles or people people who like understanding how I don't know they try to do a, a, a sofa from many different points and they don't understand how it works and they try like this and they try like this and they find a way and they're like they solved some topo simple topological problem and they're like super happy but actually they did math <laughs> or people are observing something on like people who cook who are great cooks usually they kind of observe make many different experiences and they find some good proportions yeah you can say it's more chemistry than mathematics but there are sometimes these little tricks people find that can be very close to mathematics or just also people use a lot of physics when they cook that they also don't remember yes something. yes and children when they speak and they, when they ask questions many of these questions are actually mathematical questions i think like uh, like why are there more uh, trees than birches or something like this or i don't know there are sometimes questions which are Actually, just mathematical questions, and um, yeah. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> um, I also wanted to mention that for me, uh, like doing some outreach project has uh, very pleasant side effects that I didn't 
you know, have, have, they were not my goals, but I'm very happy to see them, for example. So I was just now at a research program where I uh, announced my secret uh, project that you, I hope, will see in a couple months. But uh, I asked everyone who wants to participate in it as a research program. And while relatively few people have participated, everyone was discussing it every day. So every lunch we had with colleagues became much better for me because at least part of the lunch was talking about something I can you know, uh, relate to. And it's, I think it gave a new interesting topic for a conversation. And it was wonderful. Um, because, you know, often when people from different continents and different backgrounds meet, things they can discuss are like new COVID restrictions. And um, as a main topic, besides math. And, uh, and so now we had something else to talk about that was wonderful. Um, but okay, so what are, these are like my side effects. But um, so what are your reasons? Uh, yeah, there is a song like 16 reasons why I love you. Anyway, so <laughs> why, why I love outreach. So, uh, yeah, I think there are also two uh, clusters of reasons for me. Like one is uh, my personal interest in it. And second, like um, why I think it is really useful for the community and for uh, for the society. So my personal reasons are, I think the first one is quite close to some uh, to something you also mentioned. Um, as I wrote in my notebook, there is so much more in life than math and I do not want to forget it. So for me, outreach helps doing this because um, when you do outreach as a mathematician, you see how uh, people and like you meet people who are not necessarily knowing math or just did it in school and forgot since then and they have very rich and interesting lives and uh, uh, they survive without zero mathematics in it and they're fine and for professional mathematicians I think it's very hard to imagine not doing math at all and we uh, have this by default thinking that everybody loves math I mean it can happen and uh, I think it's a very Mm, kind of cold shower when you see people who uh, just uh, okay it's you know I, 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 I thought about like a baker for example who would you would just ask him what he does and he would tell about like 30 minutes non-stop about how he's making bread and how it's cool and how it's interesting and if you like uh, add this and add that you can make this bread. and like he's not stopping at all and he's like and do you know actually it's super funny if you put this raisin and you know what happens do you want to think with me about it like and for 30 minutes <laughs> sounds like a typical math for you yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, uh, yeah, so I think we we imagine by default this idea that everybody is excited so much about math, but it's it's normal because uh, there is a very big amount um, of people in mathematical labs who are like this, and it's normal because it's our little bulb. But if we go out in the world, it's uh, we are not uh, so present. So yeah, I think it's a very nice feeling for me at least to... Uh, remember that we are humans before being mathematicians and that we always can connect uh, and not necessarily talk about math all the time. So in some outreach moments, uh, not talking about math for some minutes, I found it quite amazing. Like, just not uh, throw at people like a uh, attack of mathematics, but just stop and like hear what they say or just feel a little bit more why they came here and to listen about mathematics. Maybe it's not about math content, but about something else. So this is my first reason. Actually, um, so this baker, not only does he ex assume that everyone is super interested in like all the details, but also he throws a lot of terminology on, on, on people, right? <laughs> so like just uses casually lots of terminology from baking art that no one else knows <laughs> yes yes also yeah and it's very hard i think it's not as easy because you use this term so much that you uh, you are so connected to it but actually i learned this uh, uh, so journalists uh, give an advice to people who popularize their research uh, what you do you write 10 words the first 10 words that you use mostly in your research like the themes of your articles, the uh, definitions you use all the time, like you write them down, and then you cross them out. And when you present your research, you just don't say this word, word at all. Wow. This is an advice to present your research. So you start with from, that. From journalists? Yes. Wow, that's interesting. So it's one of the exercises one can do. Wait, so what's the idea? 
So for example, uh, when people ask me what I do, I say, hello, I'm Olga. I do dynamical systems and I work with mathematical billiards. So in this case, I can't say all this stuff. I have to find a way to explain what a dynamical system is without saying dynamical system. And mathematical billiard, I also shouldn't say it. I should say something else. We are told that uh, the baker at least can let you taste their food, and so should the mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is a very big uh, problem. But I think mathematics can be also uh, made real uh, and uh, physically present in different forms. This is one of the big directions of outreach, which is uh, creating mathematical objects and making people play with them. Uh, lots of directions of outreach are related with games. And because I think like tasting a bakery is kind of analog of um, playing your small mathematical game, which is pleasant enough. So not complicated, not too complicated to be pleasant because it's not very hard to eat a croissant. Let's, let's, uh, let's say that. Yes. So uh, let me finish the reasons why I do research outreach. So the first reason, as I said, it's, I think it's, just remembering that we are humans, and for myself also, just to have some kind of uh, reality check, so to say. Uh, and uh, the second reason, it, it, it was, I think it's, uh, I'm very interested in storytelling and telling stories, and outreach is a very good playground to do uh, storytelling, like just to, to play with it. And forms are very various, you can create your form. So for me, it's... Uh, uh, it's a uh, yeah it's kind of an exploration uh, field a little bit artistic i like to see it as an artistic activity outreach um so these are my personal reasons and for more kind of uh, serious reasons um i think there are many stereotypes about mathematicians uh, that uh, do not necessarily correspond to complete re reality and about research in general and science in general. And uh, doing outreach is a way of uh, breaking the stereotypes, not necessarily by saying that they are not true, but just by showing as many researchers uh, as are different. Uh, I think it's very important. Uh, and um, also kind connecting mathematics with culture. In different uh, cultures, it's uh, different places. I think in Russia, mathematics is quite a part of culture. You don't need to explain it to people, uh, probably because of the story of Soviet Union and uh, um, uh, Cold War and like the importance of mathematics uh, in uh, in defense and in going uh, to space, etc. But in France, I see very... Um, Often I hear the opposition of rational and irrational, of mathematics and uh, of reason and emotion, and they're kind of opposed to something very different and not at all connected. Uh, although for me, um, even research in mathematics is uh, uh, mixing reason and emotion, and in general life is mixing reason and emotion, and actually these things are not as uh, just, it's very hard to disconnect them. So uh, for me, this. Um, way of looking at mathematics as part of culture, as part of history, as part of our human experience, uh, it's uh, an important message to pass. Then how do you pass this message is another question, but this is one of the goals I pursue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a huge goal. And um, you're right, it's important. And even in Russia, I think math is seen as part of culture by few people. <laughs> <laughs> you, were, optimist, you, were, you were privileged to be surrounded by those two people. <laughs> yes, I for think, sure, you are right. But I think uh, this brings me to my next question, question which, again, um, I'd like to... Um, um, okay. Um, which I'd like to uh, answer related to what you were saying before, and then uh, I wonder about your answers too. So... Uh, I wonder uh, what do you think is missing in the existing outreach, or as much as we know. And um, for me, uh, the first thing that um, that uh, is missing, and I'd like to add it, or I mean, I haven't met it in the existing say, math museums and such, and I would like to add it, is um, to share the process of doing math rather, rather than uh, its results. So usually when people present uh, math to general audiences speak about some objects, statements, blah blah blah. So like things that mathematicians have created, and I have seen very little 
um, conversations and attempts to share the process, like the process of mathematical thinking, our work and such. And uh, I find it, yeah, so for me, it's actually even maybe more important, I mean, not less interesting than the results. And um, another thing is that I think most, well, not most, but like a lot of existing uh, outreach is about some visual things. So when uh, you yeah. when you imagine a math museum or like an exhibition related to math, there you'll see like fractals and I don't know, some algebraic surfaces of different shapes and then all the Klein, Klein bottle, all these very visual things. Whereas um, for me personally, um, it is, um, uh, it is uh, the beauty of mathematics is uh, for me in abstract counterintuitive ideas that uh, make things sense when you think longer about them. And so um, I hope to explore what the beauty of math is for other mathematicians because I think we only share like a tiny fraction of it when we, sh when we show fractals and such stuff. Um, and yeah, and the third um, big part that I think is undervalued and should be celebrated more is the value of people in mathematics as part of mathematics. So um, I don't believe that modern math exists like separated from the researchers that do it. And, um, and uh, you have a true fan who has studied all your uh, projects. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so I hope uh, we, we could um, contribute more to um, letting people know about the, the treasure of people in mathematics because um, th there is a lot to celebrate. Uh, but I wonder what, what do you think is missing or what would you like to add? Yeah, I, I, I really like your, uh, uh, how to say, your missing parts in mathematics uh, about mm -hmm. this. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I understand why. Uh, I understand why people put fractals in mathematical museums because they're visual. That you can touch them, you can interact with them, and all these parts about uh, ab abstract mathematical thinking. Uh, for some people, abstract thinking is natural. Uh, of course, you can go further and further in it, but some people have it easier, and some people have to learn it. And um, I think mathematical museums uh, uh, don't want to. Uh, kind of lose the people who like the abstract thinking uh, but uh, yeah like the question is how to share how to share this abstract thinking what are the forms and formats to do it because uh, do we need to find objects that replace uh, this abstract ideas do we have to write stories uh, what what are the good formats I agree it's a, it's a very interesting uh, question uh, and um, for myself, uh, I, what I think is missing, uh, yeah, I agree that speaking about process is very important. I think it's a general uh, problem in our culture that we value uh, the result much more than the process. I don't think mathematics is any specific in it. Uh, I think it's very interesting to speak about mistakes in mathematics and uh, like how many theories and comprehensions were actually uh, born either from mistakes either from chance, sometimes people make two mistakes and they kind of uh, cancel out and uh, you find a law. I think Kepler found his second law in this way. So there are sometimes uh, uh, discoveries which, uh, do, which, uh, which come from some uh, randomness. And there are also discoveries which come from a very hard work and we know the examples of them. Uh, uh, that people work for very long, long years and prove some theorems. Uh, but uh, yes, I think we still have lots of progress to do on think, speaking about uh, long and hard work and also about mistakes. I think it's a very good, it's a good project to do is to tell mathematical mistakes. And also I think it's a very fun project to do also to uh, tell some wrong mathematical statements and give some proofs of them which are actually incorrect and like ask people to find the mistake because like clearly you prove something very very bizarre um if, if you have some thoughts you can interrupt me also because oh i had you, thoughts. You certainly uh, have thoughts oh i had thoughts oh yeah so about what you said about the process i think the fact that i mean as, as you said it's a general thing about the culture but still 
um, when people mm, the fact that we maybe the fact the way that we present our work makes people think that uh, mathematics is about reaching some goals, which of course partly it is. But I got an email recently which I didn't know how to answer because the person was uh, wondering if they did the right thing choosing math later in their life as something to pursue, and they asked me if 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 this is an achievable goal. And I was, I mean, I was very confused because I think mathematics, if you treat studying and doing mathematics as some achievable or non-achievable goal, then um, well, I don't think it's it's I don't think it's the right question to ask. It's a process that you either enjoy or not, and depending on that, you choose whether to do. It. Um, but will there be many people that? So that's a good question. That's a very good question, by the way. Uh, whether whether there will be people to to listen about this stuff. Well, um, I think one of the hardest thing about doing outreach is actually understanding who is your target audience and what their uh, requests are. And we will have to figure it out. So I can use my YouTube channel to to look at the likes and views to see what people are more and less interested in. And actually, the, result, the, the statistics is surprising for me. Often something I thought would be so interesting, people don't pay any attention. And the other way around, I don't know, my video about how wonderful mathematicians are so this was somehow like one of the most popular in the few first ones. And I thought I said basic things, but people were very happy. So you know, you never know. You must um, you must experiment with your audience, and it is important uh, to see um, to ooh, uh, to see what the audience wants to to hear. Yeah, uh, for me, this discussion uh, when I accepted the invitation of Mura, I didn't expect. Uh, um, lots of people, a few people, but for myself, it's a very important um, discussion to have and things to learn because I think we need to speak uh, about outreach even uh, among mathematicians and people who practice it. Because uh, in my understanding, what uh, we start having these discussions, but still, uh, mostly outreach is about different uh, people and different groups of people doing projects they are interested in, but we don't have a global outreach movement and we don't have uh, different directions we really want to pursue um, so uh, I think there is lots lots uh, to do in this uh, in this direction so I'm I was just interested to speak with Mura who is thinking a lot about it um, yeah and I still didn't answer completely the question what is missing in the existing outreach let me just say quickly two things. Uh, I think we should invite people to math labs because there are lots of outreach which is kind of uh, sharing math from math labs uh, as like some some uh, places, uh, some lighthouses which share the light of mathematics to other dark places. But we also, also should invite people who come uh, to mathematical laboratories uh, as people come to museums or people come to theaters. Uh, I, I think it will be not only good for people who come, but also for us uh, to uh, being mathemat making mathematics more open in this very physical sense. Uh, and yeah, I think the third point for me, what is missing is active thinking about formats and discussing what, what are the goals of mathematical outreach, what do we want to do? Okay, it's sharing mathematics with general public, but why are we doing it? What are our concrete goals? Uh, I think sometimes they are not even conscious, and uh, mm, yeah, I think this is missing actually. What we are doing now is missing in a larger scale. Uh, mm, so, like having a community. bigger idea of, of, of why we are doing it. Yes. Yeah, that's true because I think people do separate small projects and they don't don't sum up to. to yes, at least maybe there is a discussion somewhere about the subjects, but. Uh, Mm, for now, I uh, haven't uh, haven't participated in it. I will be very happy. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I wonderfully Edward said how important it is to take your target audience in mind, and then I ignored half of your questions. So let me get to uh, two. So there were two questions on the topic that I did not want to discuss. However, if two of you are interested, that's uh, perhaps something we should talk about. So we are asked about math Olympiads. Uh, because some in some parts of the world, in particular in Russia, where we come from, math Olympiads are like the main um, entrance to mathematics. So one question is whether it should be as popular as now because students get depressed. Yes, I think so. And leave math because they cannot perform. And another 
question was, um, yeah, again, like whether one can be successful in math if they didn't do so well in Olympics. I think that was a question. Um, so what's your, I mean, I should warn you in advance, I have a very negative opinion about doing math Olympics. So <laughs> maybe you should say something positive. Uh, so let me tell you about my experience with uh, this uh, uh, so the second question is, is it necessary to be able to be good at Olympiad problems to be able to produce quality research papers in the future? Okay, <laughs> so yeah, what is quality research paper? It's really hard. To, okay, <laughs> so let me just tell you how, uh, what is my experience with mathematical Olympiads? So for sure, I was already in the mathematical world because my parents are mathematics teachers. And they said to me, Olga, there is this math Olympiad, so you can go if you want. Uh, or they just... So I had I had the knowledge that they exist, and I uh, went to the mathematical Olympiad. I would have my chocolate for one day. I would solve problems. So for me, it was not stressful. Uh, I wouldn't solve much actually, but I would just think about math problems in chocolate. <laughs> mm, that's all. I, I think the first Olympiads I did, I didn't win anything. Or, I mean. Uh, I think once I got some kind of uh, diploma, honorable diploma, like you don't have first, second, nor third place, but you solved something, so you get this little diploma. So for me, it was actually, uh, it felt like a celebration because it, there were many, many students, so there were like hundreds of them. So I felt like, oh, there are so many children that like mathematics, it's cool. It was also in the Moscow State University in a very big, beautiful building. Uh, the lunch, I think, was uh, free. I mean, for me, it was, <laughs> for me, it was just funny. You know? a great girl, you just like, appreciate the chocolate and the lunches. <laughs> but I mean, yes, you are t uh, 10 or 11 years old, of course, you just appreciate nice atmosphere and good food, right? So, I mean, I didn't change much since then, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, yes, so, and then I wasn't, I never went uh, to all Russian Olympiad, so of course there, today there are very, very big levels, so you kind of work on your the level of your borough, and then you go to the city, and then you go to the region, and then you go to the all Russian Olympiad, and then you go to the international Olympiad, uh, and uh, sometimes you you don't go somewhere because you don't succeed and there's it's very competitional and like the further you advance the more uh, you have to work and it's really hard work people go to uh, camps and they solve problems all the day etc so i never went even to the all russian olympians i i won the second prize moscow olympiad uh, tournament like the last year of my school and it was very good because i didn't have to pass the exams in the university so i was very happy but i think i just i just worked on olympiad is, Okay, it's not as an exam, but it's, there is something about uh, just learning how to solve this kind of problems. Uh, so it's actually just hard work. Uh, but yeah, I can't say that uh, it influenced in a big way the way I relate to mathematics. So I think that it was not too much in it uh, and I was not too out of it. But um, I think that m many of my friends participated in all Russian Olympiad. Um, my sister participated in it, and I see the things that, okay, there is your relationship to mathematics, but is, there is also the, the group of people you see around you who are passionate about mathematics, who want to solve problems, and uh, it can be a good way to connect, to make friendships. It can also be stressful, I agree. Uh, it can also be stressful, uh, and uh, of course it may uh, create and use this competitive spirit, etc. I agree. Um, so it it depends, I think, on people who surround you and on the um, intention that the people uh, who guide you have. Uh, I also can say that uh, I met recently people from Kazan, uh, uh, for example, Ludmila Lazareva, who is uh, responsible for Olympic movement in Kazan, and she's working with children from um, seven, eight years old to solve mathematical problems. And she says that the competition is not necessarily bad for young children because they, they are motivated to win at the second, but then they don't need a diploma. They go, okay, diploma, I don't need it. They just want, in the moment, they are kind of motivated. Okay, they, this, this um, team solved this problem, this team solved, okay, let's solve it. They are very um, simple beings in some sense, and it's, it's motivating to, uh, to have problems to solve. Uh, so I think, yes, there are uh, probably the 
caveats and the problems that you can get by doing Olympics, but it can also be a very big school of life. And I think you can say about any any important activity which will take lots of your time, uh, this thing. So for me, there are also good sides of Olympics. But please tell me what you think. Yeah, so I think actually what I, my hate speech towards Olympics does not contradict at all what you're saying because I agree that for kids it, for kids who are not non-stop like for who are not trained 24 hours a day to do math olympics it can be just like a fun activity to come once a year eat a chocolate but um unfortunately what why i am so negative about math olympics is because i was uh personally traumatized by at the university by uh people who performed very well at math olympics because a it made them feel as if they were smarter than everyone else and um did not need to respect people who didn't do so well at math olympiads and b just okay ignore my trauma for them i saw how they burn out in the undergrad because they have spent so much time in middle school and high school doing math and like being forced to do math and um it's very hard you know when you're successful at math olympiads i mean the questions were about like oh if you're not successful can you do research yeah of course you can do research in fact uh I hardly ever hear researchers talk about Olympics. It's like irrelevant actually outside Russia and maybe China and I don't know, US. Um, but um, uh, seeing young people having a burnout and I remember asking their trainer, uh, like why did that happen so early with them in undergrad? And he said, of course, it's very hard to experience the peak of your success when you're 15. You know, for others, the life is just starting. You're just like, uh, starting to figure out your potential and for some people they have already been successful and then like since research is a completely different activity than um than solving math olympiads it's as i think andrew Wall said that it's comparing sprint to marathon i mean if you put it sprinting it has not, it says nothing about how you are running marathons in fact it forces you to learn completely new new things and the last thing that was impressive for me is that while I was surrounded by people who did very well. Um, um, well, yeah, okay, I agree with the comment that many, sure, many people burn out anyway at undergrad, that's okay. And burning out at any moment of your life is of course completely normal and human. However, um, for, for, for a group of people I was surrounded by, it happened very simultaneously and very uh, clearly. Uh, but one, one more thing that I thought made me Mm, was like my um how do you say it the other day uh, mm, survive, my survival kit was in a way better because um when you do olympiads you are so used to being able to fully understand the problem and the the concepts there and to to be able to figure it out that uh, research may be even harder than for people who have never done math olympiads this is something counterintuitive but i figured during undergrad that while my background was much much worse, math my, my mathematical background than of people surrounded by me. I much quicker got the, used to the idea of having black boxes, and it was easier for me to like um, somehow get something out of you know research talks at seminars, which where people were talking about things I didn't quite understand, but but like I could you know get something out of it nonetheless. Whereas some of my classmates who were you know uh, brilliant at solving problems with understandable. <laughs> Uh, statements mm. for them it was uh, much more painful to accept that they don't understand these concepts or like all the details of the theory and yet have to progress pursue it further so um i have totally seen the effects of like negative effects of math olympiads on people's mental well-being mathematical success and general like you know life um mm -hmm. interactions but uh, these are very special people who are trained to be absolutely brilliant at math olympics who you know had time mm -hmm. medals and such so this is very different from just like going and mm -hmm. having fun have fun so and and the the answer about being depressed well i don't know if you have kids or you see kids who you know do the olympics too much and get depressed well take them out of it this is absolutely not what they should be doing if this makes them upset this is like just the wrong thing to do with your life yes i think uh, it's uh, a lot of question of pleasure like for example, uh, and to connect a little bit with outreach, I think the, maybe the best way to do Olympics uh, for young children, especially, is to see it as outreach in the sense that okay, 
uh, a person comes to the math club and they do mathematics and uh, they are connected to mathematics. If they like, they continue. If they don't like, they leave and that's okay. For example, in this Kazan club, like uh, uh, the teachers they, there say that uh, half of the children leave after the first year and those who stay, stay till the end. And this seems logical for me. I mean, probably there are also some people who uh, don't enjoy and are uh, forced to do it probably by their parents or some other issues or they just uh, have a different mindset in their heads. But uh, I think that the question of pleasure in the process, having pleasure in the process of doing mathematics is something that uh, we need to learn also as researchers because if you are goal-oriented, you burn out. So I think probably lots of burnout people, they they uh, they are goal oriented at some moment and it's very tiring and i find it quite difficult to um, find pleasure in doing math you need to really uh trick your brain in some way because i, I really believe that it's not a very natural activity to do mathematics uh, so we we need to at least for me i don't feel it it's very natural but i'm interested so i'm trying to kind of find the ways um but yeah, I think it's very important to find pleasure from problem solving, and I think we have it in us. But uh, uh, on a long term basis, it's a, it's a work to do, and it's for sure psychological uh, component in math is very important. Uh, yes, but um, yeah, uh, yeah. I also like how we speak about they the they who who get burnout like as if yeah, it's not about, about people, us, not about us. <laughs> Yes, exactly. That's the thank you for asking this this question with no answer. How to remain pleasure oriented with all those deadlines and responsibility and the three referee reports that you're late with and the you know the, the job application deadlines that I have to take care of. Well, it's hard. Um, actually, the next video I want to make is about my trick. Uh, how to like I, I was um, feeling like writing job applications in the last two months and you know this takes a lot of time and effort and it's not. It's, I mean, it's something that is not maybe meant to be pleasant, uh, but um, I had my trick and I'll share it in the next video. And the trick was to, uh, to finally follow Ina's advice from the first interview and purchase the book, The Art and Craft of Problem Solving and go uh, solve, like start your day with solving some like uh, problems for kids, which are fun and read that book, which is great. And I loved it. And this helped me to stay sane. Um, yeah, you should find your ways. That's like hard. Yeah, <laughs> this is a cool way to deal with it. I think that the the answer is to, uh, at least for me, to get back to the why I'm here and why I'm doing mathematics. Uh, and uh, if for you it's for, for the joy of mathematics, yeah, you have to go back to the problems which are joyful enough, enough and not difficult enough. For me, it's also about uh, sharing with people who are mathematicians. And uh, if I feel there are many deadlines and things like that. I just go to some uh, mathematical friends and do some math with them. I remember one time I was like, oh my God, I have to organize this and that, this and that. And, and I had very, uh, not much time. And I was like, okay, I just go to my collaborator and I say to him, let's speak about math. And it was very nice for me at the moment. So I think we have time. I do this every day with some of my collaborators. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it's the best way to speak about math. Yeah. But also, uh, there are, of course, different ways. For example, a friend of mine told in, uh, in told me that um, for him, what helps him to... As, so there are questions like how to remain pleasure-oriented, how to find pleasure. So he said uh, what helps him is to do research projects with undergraduate students. So to come up with problems to work with them, because mm -hmm. he said undergrads don't yet have all this like, you know, referee papers deadline and, you know, worries about your papers not being accepted to journals and such. And he said it, it reminds him of the pleasure aspect and uh, helps to connect with it, which I thought was a very cool um, thing. I've never uh, done that, maybe in the future. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I had a master's student last year and now have a PhD student. And I think it's also very nice to work with people who are younger than you because I feel, I mean, I I feel I have some experience like just uh, from the way of working with math that I can share, uh, which seems very useful to them. And they have all this energy to think about a problem. So it's a, it's a very nice way also to not uh, feel the pressure uh, on... <laughs> working on the problem uh just sharing it with somebody who 
uh, yeah, just sharing it with somebody who is younger and actually older than you that works as well. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think, I think there is no universal answer. Yeah. Everyone has their, their own ways for sure. But, um, um, you know, I have one more question that, I mean, it, it's, maybe you have mentioned something about it, but it's a, a question I really want to know an answer to. Uh, so how do you, uh, when you do outreach or in general, when you talk to non-mathematicians, how do you make yourself and your work relatable? Mm, uh, I think I try to be, um, yeah, the first thing is to not to speak too much about math. I already said it. I think it's uh, important not to rush mathematics on people uh, and to wait for people to and to find, give time to people to find what is relatable. Like, I mean, it's their, it's their work, actually. It's the work of the person who listens to me to find how I'm relatable to them. But I need to give them time and, um, yeah, maybe ask questions. Um, this is one of the answers. Did I have some other answer? Let us let us see. It's a good question. It's already interesting. Um, yeah. Yes. Ask that, questions is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's what I wrote. So yeah. Uh, not forget that people who are not mathematicians are not interested in math as I am. So I think this is the the, the only thing. Um, yeah. Interesting. What do you think? So I also thought, so I mean, uh, I'm asking this because I think it's hard to make yourself relatable as a um, mathematician. And I have been told several times this year that I'm intimidating. For, and this has upset me a lot because I thought, you know, oh, I laugh all the time. I have curls. I'm so approachable. And then several people told me, you're intimidating. Um, oh, okay. We have a guest uh, coming. So, um, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and that what, what happens often is that when I, mm, can you come? Sorry, it's like we want the cat to join. Can you come? Yay. Oh my god! <laughs> oh no! <That's> it. <laughs> exactly. This is this is how my conversation happens. Um. Okay. Um. <laughs> Good, come. Okay, I was asked to let the guests speak, but I think it's a discussion, not an interview, so I want to talk myself as well. Ah, so. no, I think they meant to think about the cat, actually. I'm not sure. It's... Okay, the okay, cat, sure. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to say that um, the, the, the problem that um, happens often is, okay, intimidating is one thing, but also people just don't... I, I feel strong disbelief once you start talking about why you do math or what... You, like, people, people immediately push away, um, and one thing um, that um, that uh, I, I I started telling recently, and then sometimes I see relate like the feeling of being relatable is I started to telling people that I think um, what um, what I enjoy the most in math is storytelling. I tell them you know I like stories. I like you know telling stories about life, stories about math, listening to stories like uh, stories are cool and. And then people often say, oh, I love stories too. And so if, if you can convince people, well, if I can convince people that for me math is about stories, then like so far it's the only thing that worked for me. So, um, yes, yes, this can be a way. Uh, I think that like sometimes we say mathematics is this mathematical story, uh, this mathematical problem is beautiful, this one is not. But I think sometimes it's really the way you tell it for sure. Uh, I think uh, you know. For example, sometimes we uh, do not, we can't play the same music as some pianists can, but we it's, it's still can feel that they they are passionate about it and they like it. I think in mathematics already this uh, step is important. Like if you manage to speak about mathematics um, and people see that you like it, it's already for me something because everybody likes something. So people see that you love mathematics, even they, if they don't understand what you speak about. This is, I think, is already valuable and relatable. And there is another thing, I think it's very touching in mathematicians, the problems like that we can't explain. Sometimes we just can't explain what we do. 
<laughs> and but we want we try and we try and we try and like and I have this uh, we did this movie actually about uh, cutting a cake in French and it's exactly this, so the setting was to do a movie in 48 hours with a a director that you meet. So I met a director and she uh, asked me questions about what I do and I had an idea of a mathematical problem to speak about in a movie. And I tried to explain you, her the problem, but she didn't understand. And so we did a movie about me struggling to cut a cake and do some flips on it. And, and like, this is a movie about a popularization struggle, outreach struggle, uh, outreach in a much general way, just trying to explain to people what we do. And uh, yeah, maybe, the, the most important thing is to be able to express why why mathematics is so important for us. Like it's already for ourselves, like why do we do it? And I think sometimes it's it's very hard to explain because it's uh, we don't think about it much, maybe, I don't know. Because one of the reasons is that it's an addiction. There is, <laughs> there is no, like you can say all these abstract beautiful words and then and yet all of us feel bad when we don't do math for a long time. It's like, it's, it's a physical thing. And But somehow people who do drugs are not asked to explain why do they do drugs. They're not asked to find abstract reasons for that. They're understood. Whereas, I mean, for it's a reason. It's a valid reason. <laughs> I personally, for me, math, like it calms me down. You know, when there is emotionally you know, ups and downs and everything is, the world is, you know, falling apart and there is so much overwhelming and then I open the math paper the first feeling I get is peace and calm and this is this is something I physically need yeah five minutes later I'm upset that I don't understand that paper I I, I get frustrated and whatnot but uh, it's um it's uh very yeah there I think most of mathematicians experience physical things in their body when they do mathematics, <laughs> which are left out of all the discussions about why we do math. <laughs> um, oh my God. So we are asked, we, we received a bunch of questions that I personally have no idea how to answer. About. Yeah, and they're not very much related to outreach. Also, yeah, so COVID-19 uh... programming, climate change crisis. Look, math has, a, is math, like some parts of math is related to all of that for sure. My personal research is absolutely unhelpful for climate change, uh, pursuing programming and helping COVID-19. I, I, hmm. I don't even apologize. For yeah, that. actually, we had a discussion with my husband also because we are both worried about climate change. And I was thinking like, OK, mathematicians work is hard to sometimes hard to explain because you think like, OK, maybe I should be doing something useful to stop climate change and etc. But I think actually there is one argument that a mathematician's job is not so bad uh, ecology-wise. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't do harm. We just think about mathematical problems on paper or even just in our brains. Uh, we just use the energy of our bodies. We can As long as we don't run out of chalk problem. on the planet, we're yes. fine. <laughs> If there's no chalk left, it will be our fault. Yes. <laughs> so I think it's we don't do much harm. It's a, it's a, some it's like theater in some way. It's a way to connect uh, with people. Uh, it's like dancing. Uh, it's very human activity, which doesn't use much uh, of the planet's energy. So for me, mathematics in this sense is quite good. We got a comment that we shouldn't use paper. I use I, I like since the beginning of pandemic, I got to use iPad instead of paper. So yeah. Um, Clean up, clear on that. I should say that. Um, yeah, I don't the, know. There okay. is also some. Technology. Okay, that's an, uh, that's a uh, that's a good. We will get back to outreach. Don't get us completely distracted. But yeah, uh, <laughs> you're right that uh, trip, like flying to conferences is not ecological. And currently, the community is thinking about it. For example, there is a new initiative of organizing transcontinental conferences. It's a conference which takes place in two places in Europe and in the US, so that people could reach it by train. There will be one in Bonn in some. Uh, sorry, in Bonn and. I think uh, Canada or US, I forgot, in summer. So uh, the community is trying to come up with uh, with ways to approach these questions. I can assure you that many mathematicians do think about climate change crisis. And um, so um, it's OK. Um, let me ask you something else. Um, yeah, so uh, I wonder, and also I wonder about uh, if, if someone in the audience also has a question to that. What is uh, your dream outreach project? What would you uh, Okay, so I have many, but um, yeah, I think 
the kind of the big boss of my dreams is uh, okay i tell you this and like i'm telling it online so i kind of feel be irresponsible to do it in my life <laughs> but i think i want to do a mathematical musical comedy because it really uh, kind of responds to all my wishes about outreach because it should be fun it should be beautiful it should be about mathematics people should dance sing and all those things yes so this is a big dream outreach project Yes. Uh, other than that, I would like to make some short films about mathematics, maybe about mathematical mistakes. I'm thinking about it very seriously since yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> this has been the, the, the title of this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yeah, that's for now. And what are your dream projects? Mm, yeah. So, um, I have to, yeah, so, uh, oh no, uh, nothing happened yesterday, but just uh, the phrase, I am thinking about it seriously since yesterday, I think summarizes as well our... Uh, no, but actually we spoke together about things related to this and I thought about this idea uh, yesterday. Right. I don't remember already, you know, yesterday was yesterday. <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, for me, the two, so I, th I thought uh, a lot in the last months, which kind of projects would I like to do in the long term. And I think the two that are most interesting for me, and um, I hope to, to to make them happen. One is, uh, as I said, um, um, oh, I, I also like the the dream about physicists uh, yeah. discussing outreach and making physics understandable for four mathematicians. That's that's wonderful. Mm. I, I, I check plus one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, my dream number one is, as I said. Um, to uh, to record the process of um, mathematical thinking, uh, and I hope uh, I or even better we will be able to uh, to make that happen. I think this could be really curious. Um, and uh, another uh, thing that I want to do long term is to create a space uh, where uh, adult people uh, can do math as a hobby. So for kids, there are, you know like math circles and this kind of things uh, like. I think in, in most countries there is some way for a kid who aspires to, to, to solve math problems to do it in some place with other kids. However, for adults, um, uh, I think um, there, well, I have almost never heard of such a place where you could just like come, you know, once a week as a hobby to solve some problems, to learn some beautiful math or, um, um, or uh, yeah, just... Um, just uh, enjoy with no competitivity involved, no um, career-related things involved, just for fun. So this is something I would like to give to the world or to people who want it. I, for about that, I have asked a uh, target audience, as in my friends, and a bunch of them expressed interest. So I want to do that eventually when I have a lot of time, no deadlines, uh, all that, <laughs> all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, so these are my dreams and. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful dream. The second one, I think it's a wonderful dream. I had some experiences in my life and people who are not related to mathematics, my friends, asked me about mathematics and we spent like more than one hour doing math and discussing about math. It was not uh, very, very extensive in my life, but each time it happened, it felt really like a dream. So if you manage to do it on a regular basis, like once per week, it will be amazing. Um yeah um i don't know we started receiving some weird comments that diminished the meaning of physics i don't know what to do about that <laughs> um yeah i should say that physicists know i think on average much more math than mathematicians know physics and there is a disbalance that is bad on our side and it would be great mm. if uh there would be a way to improve it mm. i yeah so there's uh, in switzerland there is this uh, association swiss map which I am part of, I think. Um, and um, I was in the meet Swiss Map General Meeting, and there were some physics. So MAP stands for math and, and physics. No? Approximately, I think, uh, slightly differently. But OK, it's, it's all around math and physics and mathematical physics. And at that meeting, there were both mathematicians and physicists. And um, it was so there, there was a new initiative to try to like organize a seminar where we just 
explain for, to each other the words that the other ones hear a lot in talks, but would like to know what it really means. Mm. Um, yeah, so there is some some effort in that direction, but yeah, there is a I think there is a huge gap between the communities. And, Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, in Russia, I heard about another initiative. It's not really physics, but but engineering, and I really loved the idea. It's uh, ca- making uh, students come. It was for children, but it may be done at any level. But level, and people will do mathematics, but also will do engineering and like create some engineering uh, things, like create mathematics with their hands, and like this is something between mathematics and physics which can be done on a younger level. But yes, I agree about uh, mathematics and physics. I, I think Vladimir Arnold, Russian mathematician, had said that a uh, uh, mathematician who doesn't know physics is a, uh, has a disability. And uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a long time ago anyway. But um, that we need to know physics as mathematicians. That's what he, he wanted to say. And uh, yeah, I don't know physics enough to answer the question do you know physics but I, there, there is a person i'm i'm actually so the, cheers from geneva i'm actually going to geneva tomorrow so maybe i see you then <laughs> <laughs> um oh <laughs> should we mention proust yeah totally uh because three of so three of videos on my channel did mention proust it's your it's your turn <laughs> oh i love proust i i read him in french i i read uh, Akute de Chiswan in french and i loved it wow it's good <laughs> it's very long sentences i remember like the first time i tried to read it in the beginning there is this a uh, story about him reading, uh, like falling asleep in a chair and reading a book. I think something like this. And I was in a plane reading it, and I had fallen asleep as well. So it was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think Proust is very. Uh, I, I I don't I don't remember exactly the citations of people who mentioned Proust on your channel, but. Proust is, uh, he's speaking about thinking himself think, and I think mathematicians do it a lot as well, so that's probably why we like Proust. Mm. One of the reasons, certainly. Um, um, I think people try to distract us by all means from discussing mm. math outreach. Okay, let's do uh, some uh, last uh, couple of questions. Okay, well, I'm looking for a question. You can say what's your favorite poem. What's my favorite poem? Oh, I don't know. I'm Russian. I have many favorite poems. <laughs> what's your favorite in- poem in English? My heart in the highlands wherever I go. It's a short version of this poem. <laughs> I love it too. <laughs> I was thinking you would say actually when I thought when I when I we walked today so Ola lives in a, in a suburb with very beautiful nature and we walked through this forest and um well uh and I was thinking um that uh when you speak about all the projects you want to be doing that uh, your poem should be uh, the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep oh, and miles to go before I sleep. I love this poem. And to go before sleep. <laughs> oh, I love this poem as well. <laughs> but the one you mentioned is also what my mom told So me. this one is pro- uh, Frost, right? Yeah. Wonderful. Very short, beautiful poem. Um, okay. So uh, another uh, question I wanted to ask is... Um, this way discuss. So, uh, would you like to, or uh, have you already mentioned everything uh, that are your personal struggles when you do outreach? My personal struggles. Let me let me <laughs> think what I wrote. Okay, so the first point I wrote. I'm happy with outreach, but um, yeah. So one of the struggles I had. Um, uh, sometimes it depends. So sometimes outreach project I do is completely uh, created by myself and I have more control on it. And sometimes I did some projects like going to schools, for example, speaking to children and or I was inviting, invited in some settings that already exists. And I think for me, I had many bad experiences when I was speaking to people who were in some sense forced to be there. For example, children in school who didn't decide that a mathematician will come speak to them and they would be bored, they wouldn't be interested in listening to me. And uh, I struggle with that because I think that uh, mm, mathematics shouldn't be forced on people as anything else. So I try to avoid uh, from 
like two years ago, I tried to avoid this kind of uh, outreach projects. Um, you can say, okay, it's, it's good in some sense because some somebody there in the audience will still love mathematics and change their opinion on mathematics. But for me, it's there is too um, too much of bad emotions that I live when I see uh, people who are not uh, uh, not interested in what I'm saying. So I try to avoid these things. Um, yeah, and another thing I already mentioned, so I, I would love to actually know what people think about mathematical outreach. And uh, the thing sometimes I hear that like people are happy to see somebody human speaking about math, and this is very nice. But I don't often get many questions about, okay, and then what is next about mathematics? Usually people um, ask much, general, much more general questions uh, about mathematics. Uh, I don't know, does it mean that uh, they're more interested in mathematicians and mathematics itself? Uh, for me, it's an open question. Um, yeah, maybe I have other struggles. Let me think about them. Why would I can you tell you mine, you yours? and I hope you can relate. <laughs> I find it hard to find, a, I mean, the, the, you can see the title of this channel, but I personally find it hard to find a balance between research and outreach. And while I dream about pursuing both activities and finding that balance, I think both of them are very important for me and I'd like to do both. However, um, however, um, both of these activities are very engaging and, you know, I personally can be obsessed with both of them, which means, uh, that, um, which means that it's, it's hard to, to find a balance. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing, uh, is also, I mean, that's nothing. I mean, I just experienced it with my tiny, uh, outreach way, but I guess, I mean, I understand it's a general thing, but still, uh, the fact that, um, your uh, ambitions are growing while you're doing something. So you know um, you 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 learned to to make interviews, and then you want to make the next thing. But people want you to keep doing interviews, and um, it is um, it's hard to to keep up the balance between things that uh, you found your target audience for that wants you to do and is happy, and yet you personally want to grow and and do other things. So that I I still I have no idea how to. Uh, find that balance either well i have very um, yeah just to do different projects <laughs> <laughs> okay but there's a question how to get started um, yeah it's also a good question but i relate a lot to the res uh, research outreach balance uh for me it's also a big question uh uh also inside the mathematical community and for myself um yeah, I mean, if you do more outreach, you have less time for research. Although I think that, at least for me, uh, uh, doing outreach, I think, made me a better mathematician because I can understand better how to explain things I and I can um, verbalize things that I understand better. So I think it's as in teaching mathematics also, doing outreach makes you a better math mathematician, but you still have to uh, find a balance of how much you do research and how much you do outreach. Um, that's for sure. Actually, about explaining, I also noticed this effect. So I, I gave my first colloquium talk uh, a week, two weeks ago. Colloquium talk is something which you're very supposed to speak to a general mathematical audience, like not just to algebraic geometers, but also to people who do, you know, PDEs and graph theory and whatnot. And this was the first time I had to do it. And I was quite scared. However, um, I tried to imagine that I'm talking to my YouTube audience, which is like 3,000 people I haven't met uh, who have some interest in mathematics. And I tried to prepare a talk with like that in mind, which was somehow more concrete for me than just like PDE people, because I never meet PDE people in real life. But I did get like comments and questions from my subscribers. And, and it went so well, you know? I, I put effort into trying to be more relatable and making jokes and whatnot. People were so happy. I had like the whole evening of people thanking me. It was wonderful. And I think without the YouTube channel, I would I would not be able to do it that way. And people would be less happy. So, uh, how yeah. do we get starting in doing math outreach? Oh, you just go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, that's a bad answer. Okay, tell right? so. Well, I don't know. Uh, let's let's remember how I started. Um, I think. Uh, so, in some sense, teaching is math outreach. Because I mean, 
teaching is it depends to whom you teach but each time you pass mathematical knowledge to somebody even speaking about mathematics to your family or to somebody in the street is already math outreach uh, then uh, it depends if you are a researcher or you are a teacher or you are just somebody who is interested in mathematics. You can um, join some initiatives that exist already. So, for example, uh, in France, uh, in mathematical labs, there are, for example, uh, school students who come to the labs from time to time, or there are uh, possibilities to work with schools and go there to uh, help students solve problems. There are uh, what is called Fête de la Science in France. The, uh, celebration of the science in October and there is you all, always can propose some talk or something like that uh, this are uh, so usually you can ask people who do outreach uh, to give you some ideas of what is already organized and you can just join the team and not uh, build your project from start this is one of the ways and another way is to build your project from start <laughs> <laughs> as Muga did with your uh, YouTube channel, so you just uh, choose the thing you want to do. Uh, and you find uh, you maybe ask some advice of people who did something close to it, or ju you just do it, and then you uh, build on the first um, uh, idea. I can say that uh, I think I have grown as a uh, popularizer of mathematics. Uh, in the beginning, I would make uh, some talks and then I would uh, add some jokes to them and then I would do some math clowning and uh, math <gasps> presentations. I loved performing. your video. So if, 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 if you can stalk on Olga and find a video where she has the math clown presentation, it's so adorable. I loved it. I will not post a link. You must, I mean, if you're really determined, you can possibly find it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, uh, it was, uh, yeah, you can also... Uh, in math outreach, at least, I like doing this. I do some different activities, for example, the theater, and I like mixing the activity I do with mathematics. I think it's a very fun way to find new formats, like mixing clown with mathematics. If you dance, you can do a mathematical dance. If you make uh, poems, you can do poems about mathematics. If you're a baker, you can make a something which you There's a very, has a report with mathematics, etc. My most popular subscriber on YouTube is the guy who does uh, songs that ex that uh, explain some mathematical rules and formulas. Wow. Um, I forgot what's his name, that's unfortunate. Something with Fox. Well, hmm. some we, okay, he has many subscribers, but I should know him, uh, in German. Yeah, but uh, I think that outreach, uh, we didn't give a definition of outreach, but in some way, for me, uh, outreach is, uh, putting mathematics somewhere where it is, uh, there is not so much of it on like at least making it clear that it is there or connecting like uh, pushing mathematics in some different areas different places different uh, uh, activities uh, I like doing uh, math and art activities but it also can be other there are other ideas there are fox. The fox. Well, uh, yeah uh, fox is the fox in German thank you um, yeah, interesting. So, okay, after I gave the bad answer, I could give at least a couple of comments. But first, um, <laughs> first, okay, when I said just go for it, I meant that, um, well, um, two things. First, um, the the risk is very low. I mean, the worst thing that can possibly happen to you is that you will put some effort and some time into a project that few people will appreciate. But no one will get hurt, nothing bad will happen, and some, I mean, at least your family and close friends will appreciate because they love you, and um, and uh, no, like, you can do no harm by doing math outreach. That's a, a privilege, actually, in many other, you know, things people do, they, they, they have a risk of doing harm. And, um, and yeah, you could ask for feedback if, if it's not as popular as you'd like, so maybe, like, but the basic advice uh, that I think, um, that people who do startups would give you, I think, is that a um, don't put too much like try to test on on a target audience or like on someone as soon as possible. So don't do this thing where you prepare a project for a year and then show it to the public. Like minimize the time and effort you are spending without testing it and showing it to someone and this, and 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 uh, and go. Um, um, and uh, go uh, talk to your friends and like people who are willing to talk to you about your ideas and you will get some feedback. For example, the first thing that I wanted to do, I don't know if it's, it deserves the name of outreach, but I wanted to help young mathematicians with psychological struggles of doing math. So I want to, I, I had this like plan. I thought it's a genius, I thought it's a good idea 
to offer people to um, talk to me about to young mathematicians about their psychological struggles if they want to I could listen possibly relate in some way and you know I thought it could be a good thing because a lot of people struggle especially during PhD and my friends were less excited about it than me they said oh Mura it's a good idea but we wouldn't take part in it and I didn't understand why but then I asked about their um um, their uh, reasons and I, I I was still in a disbelief phase so I put a tab on my web page and indeed very few people have contacted me and they did not want to hear my opinion actually uh, And but then when I started doing the interviews a lot of people wrote me that it helps them with their insecurities to listen to other people talk about their insecurities so in, in an indirect way I did help them but I couldn't you know I couldn't prognose it in my own head how people will react because you only know yourself right I mean knowing deeply the psychology of other people is very hard so I could not expect that this indirect way of talking about insecurities in math will be much more helpful than offering a direct conversation so in that sense I think trying different formats and talking to people who could be interested in listening to their feedback uh, is, is super important um, um, so I think uh, mm. I like this question. Maybe we should. Uh, you tell us when we stop, but I think we should maybe take. Uh, I don't know. One more question. Two more. Questions. Yeah. Do you want to? to I, I'm. I want to answer. You are not afraid of putting people off math. Yeah, it's a good question. I think a part of me is uh, afraid, but I think the most of. Uh, if I look at what happened to me statistically, uh, I. Only so, mostly so changes in a good direction is that people would say, ah, if I had a teacher of mathematics as you, I would like mathematics. Or like, oh, it's actually interesting or something like that. Uh, but I also had experiences when people who already are, have different, difficult relationships with math, math that couldn't accept what I say and they probably got even like, um, didn't change actually their mind about mathematics. So that also can happen. Uh, I don't do not not know personally any person that uh, liked math and <laughs> after speaking to me stopped liking it. M maybe they exist, but I don't see them because they left. So I don't know. Maybe I, I did it. Uh, I hope I don't do it. But yeah, I think some part of me is afraid of it. Maybe because of um, uh, yeah, some stereotypes people have about mathematicians. Maybe it's not about math, but about me. Like. People uh, won't like me because I'm a mathematician, something like that. But it's very, very deep inside, and it's not verified statistically uh, from my yeah. experience. So I, I get a lot of when I say do math people are like, oh, so you're kind of some kind of a genius, like, and with this mm. face expression, I I get lots of it, and then I'm like, no, I'm not a genius, not at all, except even, and but. Yeah, but uh, the thing is, what what helps us to not? I mean, I I never. That's a good question, which I have never thought about. I've never suspected that I could put off anyone from math because I believe that people who like math are addicted to it. And as as you cannot put off anyone from taking drugs, but as, or maybe I shouldn't be mentioning drugs in this in the YouTube. Anyway, uh, by if you there is you know it's like if you think of this as a maybe light but some kind of an addiction, then no words can put people off. It, except if you, you know, if you humiliate people and tell them they can't do math, that's a bad, that's a terrible idea. Maybe that's one thing one should be extremely aware of: is to never, when, when you do outreach or something, never give people, try to no, avoid giving people an impression this is something they cannot do. So you must emphasize that this is something people can do and try and enjoy. Um, Yes, I think also when, um, for example, in this girls' school for math, uh, we give them problems and then they think about problems themselves. And I think it's also related to teaching. Like when a person has a process of their mental thinking, they're somewhere in their process and it's very important to support them and to be with them in their thinking and not just come with your solution if you know the solution or just be with them much more than go to some precise goal. And I think it's this at least uh, the most successful mathematical outreach exchanges I had were when uh, we were together on the same page with a person. Mm, okay, I have more experience and more knowledge about some, some things, but we actually, when we speak about mathematics, we uh, discover it together. It's very uh, in present moment. Um, 
the real mathematical exchange it's always very uh very lively and people are kind of together on one page if if you are further where if you're in some other place and your audience uh, usually it just doesn't work yeah you're right asking questions to the audience helps and i really like your suggestion when i ask you how to be relatable and you're just like ask people questions don't don't uh start talking yourself that's that's good um yeah well there are wonderful advice to say that you're a mathematician without saying it well i don't know how to do that that would be wonderful um i um Oh, speaking of that, I, one of my favorite quotes about one of my favorite stories. I so wish it was my stories. I, I unfortunately I don't have copyrights for it, but a friend of mine said, oh, "I hope she doesn't kill me if I share it publicly." That um, uh, she um, when she was in first grade, the teacher asked who she wants to be, and she said a writer. And the teacher asked, "What do you want to write?" And she said, "Mathematics." <laughs> and this is, I mean. If, if I were to say who I am without mentioning math, I would say I'm a storyteller. I mean, not not maybe uh, not so not always great at it, but um, you know that's that's what um, it feels like to me. I in my in my soul in my heart I'm a storyteller. Then this mm. you know in the job description it says something else. But um, yes, me too. I would say yeah. Maybe that's why we like outreach. <laughs> Should we stop here? Last question? I'm, uh, yeah. Okay, my last question uh, is uh, something uh, of different flavor, which I want to mention at least. Um, how do you think, how much is outreach appreciated in academia? And mm -hmm. how could we improve that? So within the academic um, community. Um, yeah, I think it's more and more appreciated. I think we are in a good times. Uh, there are many initiatives, uh, at least in France, uh, where, where I work and I know the best. Uh, different institutions today uh, give some prizes for popularization. CNRS Center, for example, issued recently the Popularization Medal, oh, wow. uh, which is kind of equal to uh, medals for research. Um, there are different uh, advice for people who hire uh, mathematicians that say that uh, their, research, their outreach activities should also be taken into account while uh, job offerings. So I think there is... a there is uh, an understanding that outreach is important for our community but also for the whole society uh, so yeah i think it's more and more appreciated uh, i think there is still uh, a lot to do um, in um, uh, making outreach uh, an important goal of every laboratory that laboratory is uh, has activities and implies more and more researchers in this. I think it can be very useful for undergraduate students uh, and graduate students to even have a class or a course on in outreach. Uh, it can be also like maybe anxiety alleviating in some sense because they uh, don't only learn difficult math because there's, there's lots of math to learn when you are an under, undergraduate, but they also take joy from explaining it to general audience. I'm not sure there are already outreach uh, programs included in all math curriculums. So these are the things that can be done. But yeah, I think it's um, people, at least in my experience, every time I do a research, uh, an outreach project, people uh, are happy about it. They say, ah, that's a nice thing you do. And I think it's, uh, uh, it's appreciated uh, by people. We all understand that it's important to do it. Yeah, so I would say it's more and more valued. Mm -hmm. I like how positive you are. So I feel like my answers are usually more negative. And um, yeah, um, I I think while I agree with you that like uh, on a personal level, each one single mathematician, when you tell them you do some outreach, they're like, oh, that's cool. We're happy for you. However, uh, on an institutional level, mm -hmm. uh, a normal professor's job includes so much teaching and so much administration, other duties. And on top of that, of course, like you supervise students and you, you want to do your research, like on top of all your duties, that my impression is there is little um, time and space and energy left uh, for doing outreach by uh, someone who is high up in an academic ladder, which I think is unfortunate because I believe outreach would benefit from more researchers uh, doing it. And, um, and um, so in my, in my dream world, outreach would be considered as much of a valuable contribution to society as teaching and would be uh, 
also like in terms of a career, appreciate it as much. However, of course, the way the university's work is built on funding and we, you know, we, our researchers get funded for the teaching they do, uh, usually, um, except some here. <laughs> so lucky. Yeah, I don't have teaching, so I have more time yeah, for outreach. Yeah, some lucky people here. Yeah. Okay, neither do I. But <laughs> I'm temporarily in this role. I'm like, uh, and um, so okay. My hope is that there would that slowly but steadily, academia will find a way to appreciate, appreciate outreach and somehow get, get give people who want to do it, you know, time and space and, and support that. But um, I also have a suspicion, which is a speculation. I don't, I don't know if any statistics about it. But my suspicion is that while the academia is currently putting a lot of effort into increasing the diversity of uh, people within academia, I think um, like bringing people from underrepresented communities, I suspect that had if outreach would be part of the things you could do with math on a more mm, normal scale, not just like some weird thing one person does, then uh, since it involves uh, other skills and um, other maybe parts of your brain than doing research, I imagine that it could uh, diversify also the people within academia or make some underrepresented minorities, people who leave academia because they are unhappy, make them happier and give them more space to express themselves. This is my suspicion. It's not based on any statistics. Uh, yeah, at least uh, one can imagine a job yeah. proposal, an application for permanent position, which explicitly mentions outreach as one of the most important uh, uh, parts of the, this job position. And uh, it would be interesting to see the list of applicants to this uh, yeah. proposal and the list of uh, first uh, 10 chosen people for this position. Uh, and compare it to the general uh, yeah, research, yeah. I suspect, research position. I yeah, I suspect we would see differences and, or maybe like, it's a, um, of course, uh, I'm not I'm not unbiased here uh, because I find outreach so, so much fun. Um, but yeah, it would be great if in our in overall academia attempts to to bring diversity, we would, we would do it not only by, you know, there, there is now a lot of campaign about, you know, assigning special jobs for, for women, jobs for, you know, African-Americans. How about jobs with a different, uh, you know, uh, things that are included in the job description within academia? I hope this would be one of the further directions of diversifying. So the, you know, the duties and skills, not just the people we want to see. Yeah, I completely agree. And I hope it will come soon. Uh, the, the measures I have seen taken already in France go in those directions, but they still didn't reach the the moment of job of job market so i hope it will be uh, soon the case but that's not us yeah. who decide. yeah yeah sure but if we talk about it uh then i think we're doing something um yeah so i think uh we should uh, stop at some point and it was really fun to chat to you i hope we answered a bunch of questions i'm sorry that we didn't answer all of them but you also asked a lot of questions unrelated to outreach <laughs> <laughs> uh thanks to you guys for coming and for answering some of the each other's question um yes thank you very much Mora. it was wonderful to talk to you and to read your questions and uh, remarks it was super cool i'm very happy and thank you yeah and i was very distracted with the comments i'll have to rewatch it in order to hear your answers better <laughs> and <laughs> remember what you were saying <laughs> uh it's um uh Oh, now I guess who you are. Well, great, Adina. I hope to see you on on, on Monday or Tuesday. Um, yeah, the the live stream will be recorded. If you missed anything and you enjoy listening to us, you're very welcome. We are always here. And um, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you for coming. Cat says hello. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have fun. Have fun with math. Enjoy. Whatever you do, math related, and remember to to find fire in it. <laughs>